Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name's Randy Camphouse, um, as Sherry said, uh, co-author of uh, The Basque. Um, and I have the pleasure of starting today. Uh, my uh, good colleague Cecil Reynolds will be uh, following with the uh, second half of the webinar. Um, we, uh, for these webinars, uh, always have uh, uh, entirely too much content. Uh, but uh, of course, we don't want to have a webinar that's too long uh, because that can be uh, too tiring for participants. So please forgive us uh, if we go a little bit quickly. But we want to give you as much content uh, as possible and at the same time um, leave opportunities for Q&A. So uh, like our other webinars, this is uh, probably best described as a go fast webinar. So hope you tolerate that well. Uh, we do have a conflict of interest, uh, that's for sure. And this slide uh, documents that. So please be aware of, of that. If we can move to the next slide, please. We'll proceed. Some of you who have been to BAS trainings uh, have seen this um, model before for the BAS 3. And uh, uh, it is indeed a system, behavior assessment system for children, not behavior assessment test for children. Um, it's quite a substantial uh, uh, system of measures that's in, intended to give a comprehensive view of behavior, emotions, and mental health status of young children uh, through um, early adulthood. So today we'll spend most of our time um, on the um, parent rating scales, um, the teacher rating scales, and the uh, uh, student self-report. Uh, we will spend a little bit of time on the SOS and some other uh, student observation system, I should say, and some other measures. Um, and uh, we'll also weave in discussion of the um, structured developmental history um, as well. So um, given the comprehensiveness um, and the title today is the content scales, we'll focus on the three rating scales, which does not indicate in any way that the other measures are any less important for assessment, diagnosis, or treatment or intervention planning, or even prevention planning for that matter. Moving to the next slide, please. So, um, uh, as some of you know who use the uh, BASC, um, we um, uh, feature both clinical and adaptive scales uh, because we've uh, found, and there's plenty of empirical evidence to document, that clinical scales are necessary to assess the full range of a, of a child's behavioral and emotional uh, functioning at a given point in time and their mental health status. At the same time, adaptive skills are very important for prognosis, predicting outcomes, etc. So for example, um, in um, uh, one uh, large school district, we identified the president of the student body with significant um, concerns significant symptoms of depression that turned out to be uh, diagnosable as a case of depression. And um, the uh, young woman was engaged in treatment because of that. However, uh, this was um, perhaps an atypical case uh, because she was strict president of the student body, uh, getting straight A's in school and has significant adaptive strengths, a very well-liked uh, individual. So uh, I could cite many case studies where the combination of both clinical and adaptive scales or um, social behavioral strengths uh, are, are immensely helpful in combination for understanding a child or adolescent or young adult's current status, um, the types of treatments they may respond best to and prognosis, for example. Today, we're going to um, feature content scales and content scales that may be used a little bit less frequently in uh, clinical practice um, because they were not um, originally designed as featured clinical or adaptive scales on the BASC grading scales. They are equally important, however, and um, I'll uh, try to explain that as best I can. Uh, can we move to the next uh, scale, next slide, please? So these are clinical scales. And for those of you who are Basque users, you're accustomed to these scales. Um, and uh, for those of you who are new to the Basque, 
Uh, these are the feature scales for clinical diagnosis. However, as I alluded to on the earlier, um, in conjunction with the earlier slide, the um, content scales that we've been adding since the BASC-2 are increasingly important and provide powerful new tools for making uh, these important decisions about um, children, youth, and young adults. Next slide, please. So these are some sample items. Um, and it's one of the reasons uh, why these slides are not distributed widely, because um, these um, items we don't want to go public, uh, because that could skew the results. So these are teacher rating scale and teacher ra parent rating scale, uh, clinical scale sample items. And what you'll notice is that in effect, uh, whether it's a clinical scale, an adaptive scale, or a content scale, uh, content validity is crucial for the importance of the construction of the scale and the interpretation of the scale. Because if we have items on these scales that are there for empirical reasons only and may not have relevant content, uh, that will make it difficult to interpret those scales. So for example, some measures commingle anxiety and depression items on the same scale, and they may call it depression, or it may be called anxious depressed. Well, that's a very difficult scale uh, for one to interpret because it doesn't have uh, at least relatively homogeneous content. And anxiety and depression are different clinical phenomena. So it, uh, for our purposes, we separate those scales and we've been refining them over the last three decades to try to um, better differentiate anxiety and depression, although they do go together. Same thing with cases of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, one can have attention deficit in combination with hyperactivity and impulsivity. In fact, that's quite common, but it's not a rule. It's quite possible for an individual to have hyperactivity, impulsivity in the absence of attention, uh, significant attention problems and the reverse. So uh, it might be um, helpful to think about every teacher rating scale and parent rating scale as a content scale that places a premium on content validity. And the sole reason for that is to make these scales interpretable for you, the user, and for you to be able to communicate results uh, with parents, teachers, and other caregivers uh, as you're serving um, uh, a child. Next slide, please. So here uh, we see attention problems broken out uh, separately as, a, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, these are adaptive scales that have long been part of the BASC system. And um, so again, those of you um, who use the BASC are accustomed to these measures on the teacher and parent rating scales, activities of daily living, functional communication, and social skills. What is not perhaps well known is that those three scales, activities of daily living, functional communication, and social skills, comprise a, um, a good screener for adaptive behavior. So these constructs have been around uh, since the, um, Edgar Dahl introduced the violent social maturity scale uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so they're well-worn and, um, and considered core measures of the adaptive behavior construct. So uh, those three measures, if they're all below average, may warrant administration of a full-blown adaptive behavior scale. Um, and uh, if they're in the average range or above, uh, they might signify adaptive behavior um, normality or adaptive behavior strengths. Uh, adaptability, leadership, study skills. Uh, these have been on the teacher and parent rating scales for some period of time. Uh, study skills exclusively on the teacher scale, again, these are content scales, uh, like the others that I'll spend more time on in a bit. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some sample items. And one thing you'll notice with every edition of the BASC, uh, we try to 
make sure that the items are timely and aligned uh, with changes in society and changes in the English language, uh, which uh, as you know, changes virtually every day. Um, so for, here's an example on activities of daily living. When we created the first edition of the Basque, um, there was uh, quite honestly, less conversation at school about making healthy food choices. Um, but um, uh, beginning in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, this um, is a discussion that's commonly held in school as schools engage more in prevention practices and health promotion practices. So um, these new items um, that are indicated there uh, in italics come from updates to the English language, updates to societal preferences and making healthy food choices is just an example of that. Uh, similarly, uh, on social skills, accepting others, um, uh, being tolerant, um, being respectful of others uh, is an attempt to try to update the item content to, um, uh, to help um, an examiner determine uh, in another way, uh, with another probe, uh, whether or not a child uh, uh, might harbor significant biases, for example. So um, next slide, please. Leadership study skills, functional communication, some sample items from the core adaptive behavior scales of the TRS and PRS. Next slide, please. These are the content scales. So these were added in the 2005 edition of the BAS II as so-called optional content scales. And we offered them as options because they were drawn from the um, BASC uh, clinical scale and adaptive scale item content. And um, so because we had such a breadth of items available in the teacher rating, parent rating, and self-report, we wanted to provide examiners with additional tools for making uh, important decisions, diagnostic treatment and otherwise. So we went through the items, created these content scales based upon theory, uh, but uh, those of you who have been using the BASC for some period of time probably remember that we refer to them as optional. And uh, the reason we referred to them as optional back then was because um, they did, uh, did not have uh, considerable empirical evidence behind them as well. In the BASC 3, that's all changed. So these content scales are essentially co-equal um, in terms of reliability and validity evidence. Um, as you'll see in the, in the Basque manual, which is one of the reasons for the magnitude of the Basque manual. Um, so all of these um, so-called optional content scales from previous editions uh, are now content scales that have um, equally strong reliability, uh, criterion-related validity, uh, clinical group uh, validity, et cetera. So, um, so these content scales can be very important for making uh, uh, decisions. For example, bullying. So um, bullying, as it uh, um, uh, rose to uh, prominence in terms of a parental concern and a teacher concern and a child concern in the last uh, couple of decades in particular was important to add. Um, and you'll see evidence surrounding the reliability and validity of the of bullying scale. And we tried to make the content as um, sensible as possible uh, so that you could interpret this scale rather easily and without confusion. Uh, anchor control, emotional self-control, uh, negative emotionality. So we're, we're trying to capture some of those temperamental variables um, that um, uh, are very important to understand, particularly for prognostic purposes and for treatment purposes as well and resiliency, a very important construct. However, I'd like to spend uh, much of my time on this slide discussing the developmental social disorder scale. The DSD scale is an autism scale. It could, we could have easily labeled it an autism scale. However, we wanted to be sensitive to the um, uh, potential for misdiagnosis or overdiagnosis uh, and did not want to alarm 
parents. So um, uh, the DSD scale um, could be a case of autism. Uh, if it's elevated, it may not be a case of autism, maybe due to something else. Even the mere presence of an autism scale can trigger parental concern. If uh, you were to report that a, uh, that a child had a, an autism score in the at-risk range, that causes much more parental angst and concern and teacher potential angst and potential concern or even stigmatization uh, than is warranted. So, uh, so this is why we did not call our autism scale an autism scale. So developmental social disorders is very important um, for making that differential diagnosis between intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder, for example, between um, autism disorder and juvenile bipolar disease, between autism disorder and childhood or adolescent schizophrenia. Um, it's, a, it's an extremely important scale. And it functions exactly as an autism scale would predict. So um, if you are having trouble sleeping some evening, I recommend that you read the BASC manual. Um, it will make you somnolent quickly because it's so thorough. Uh, thanks to um, our, our colleagues who helped uh, prepare that very thorough discussion of reliability and validity. If you look at the DSD scale uh, and you look at the validity evidence in, in there for differentiating children and adolescents with autism from other diagnostic groups, uh, you'll find uh, that this is um, as good, if not better, um, than most dedicated autism scales. And that's been documented by a variety of investigations. So this gives you the option of getting um, a, very, uh, a very high score uh, on this scale and communicating accurately with parents. Because if it's a high score that's due to another condition like intellectual disability, for example, uh, you can uh, share with the parents that their, their child, unfortunately, has a high DSD score, and it's consistent with the other assessment data indicating um, that the child has um, an intellectual disability, as opposed to saying the child has a high autism score, but it's not autism. It's a case of intellectual disability. So it may seem like a distinction without a difference, uh, but being a parent myself and you know, interacting with other parents, we certainly don't want to uh, inappropriately or inadvertently alarm them um, when it's, it's simply not accurate. So DSD is equal to autism scale. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, excuse me, can we go back a slide? Thank you. Also want to mention executive functioning, uh, certainly because of the uh, neuroscience evidence over the last 30 years, we're very aware that um, it's important to uh, assess self-regulation and the executive functioning uh, does a good job of that. And we'll get a look at the subscales at that scale later, but this scale uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Professor Mauricio Garcia, uh, Mar uh, Mauricio Garcia Bar Barrera at the University of Victoria um, is, uh, is a well done scale thanks to um, his efforts and others. And it includes, it includes uh, subscales of executive functioning as well. So as you know, there's much concern, um, including this weekend um, in uh, when I was watching an NFL game, uh, certainly about concussion and head injuries uh, in childhood. Um, and this concern just becomes more, um, more grave uh, because of the high prevalence rate of concussive disorders of childhood. Um, the executive functioning scale is um, exceedingly important for detecting the uh, sequelae associated with um, a child or adolescent who has suffered a concussion, even worse, multiple concussions. So in those cases, um, uh, executive functioning scales are 
are increasingly important and have increasing utility for helping parents and teachers understand how to help their child as the law say, return to learn in school, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is some of the uh, sample content on the TRS and PRS content scales, uh, bullying. Um, and what we did with the BASC-3 is we added considerably, um, considerable number of new items in order to strengthen the content scales. So some of these scales were around on the BASC-2, but they didn't have dedicated item content. And we significantly strengthened them. By that, I mean, we covered the full symptomatology associated with some of these uh, content scales, like developmental social disorders, for example, where you'll see some additional content there that's unique to that scale. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And the validity indexes, I'm not going to spend much time on uh, because the content scales are, are really the topic of interest this morning. I just want to do a quick review uh, to make you aware of the F index. And the F index is a fake bad index. But the F index could be in the caution or extreme caution range, uh, not necessarily because a child has um, um, uh, not, excuse me, not necessarily uh, because there may be a validity problem with a parent rating or a teacher rating. It could very well be that the child, in fact, just has severe and diverse problems. So uh, the validity index is particularly the F index have to be used in conjunction with the others. So if you have a high F index score for a child with severe problems, then that is not indicating a problem with validity it's indicating that this poor child has severe and diverse problems. And in that case, if the consistency index is within the normal range, the patterning index is within the normal range, then uh, you need not worry about validity, no matter how high the F index is. Alternatively, if a child has T scores below 60 on the clinical scales, they're pretty much within the normal range. Um, and you have a high F index score, that could indicate validity problems because that's unlawful based upon the item content. Let's look at the next slide, please. And then we have our clinical probability indexes, and these differ substantially from the content scales that we've been discussing, from the BASC core clinical scales, from the BASC adaptive uh, skill scales. Um, these are very different animals from those because they are empirically derived, not based on content. So on the BASC, you have, in, in the case of ADHD diagnosis, you have the inattention and hyperactivity content scales, or clinical scales, I should say. And at the same time, you have an empirically derived ADHD probability index. So the ADHD probability index simply used multiple um, regression, basically logistic regression, to see which items on the TRS and the PRS at the child and adolescent levels simply differentiated the ADHD children with an ADHD diagnosis from children without an ADHD diagnosis. And so that simple um, dichotomy was used to develop this scale. And that's what the ADHD probability index uh, gives you. The probability that a child or adolescent has behavior patterns and emotional patterns that are aligned with other kids that carry an ADHD diagnosis versus not. So you, if you have the inattention scale elevated, the hyperactivity scale elevated, and the ADHD probability empirical scale elevated, there's considerable certainty that um, that child or adolescent has the symptoms, the core symptoms of ADHD. It's making a very strong case for that diagnostic decision and that treatment decision. The emotional behavior disorder probability index does the same thing. Kids with a special ed classification of EBD uh, versus not. And uh, Dr. Reynolds will talk about that later in greater detail. 
autism probability goes with the DSD, the Developmental Social Disorder Scale. Uh, functional impairment comes from the history of psychiatric diagnosis um, and the um, uh, DSM system, where the question is, okay, you have a diagnosis, let's say um, bipolar disorder, but what if your bipolar disorder is extremely well managed um, and you've, uh, uh, you just simply respond well to medication and you have no impairment in school, at home, in community, or the work setting, for example, in the case of an adult, then there's, um, you have the disorder, or you have the symptoms of the, uh, the previous diagnosis of the disorder, but you can't be diagnosed currently because you have no functional impairment. So uh, functional impairment is an important addition to uh, all the scales on the BAS, uh, because uh, if there's no um, impairment, there's no disorder. Um, general clinical probability, this is for preschoolers where differential diagnosis is more challenging. So for special education classification, eligibility at the preschool level, for example, you simply have to sh show significant number of problems. Um, and then uh, differential diagnosis can be hopefully clarified at age two or three or four. Um, next slide, please. More about the probability indexes and their content. Next slide, please. More um, information about those indexes. Next slide, please. So please be aware that as I'm working through these slides, um, uh, this information is, uh, all of it is included in the BASC-3 manual. So um, uh, you can uh, find this information there, including sample reports. Um, it's a very comprehensive guide. And so I encourage you to take advantage of it. And now that it's in digital form, uh, it's really easy to use search terms um, in, when you're on the PDF. Um, and you can find uh, what you need with uh, greater ease as opposed to you know, leafing through a hard copy manual. So this uh, gives you an example of the reporting of clinical indexes and the T-scores. Uh, next slide, please. Executive functioning items. This, these are the subscales that Mauricio discovered through factor analysis. And, um, and they're really interesting. So on our executive functioning scale, there's an overall index, but within that, you can determine whether or not a child's problems associated with, let's say, three, four, five concussive head injuries are primarily with problem solving, attentional control, behavioral self-control, or emotional self-control. Uh, and these subscales are really interesting uh, really well supported by uh, Mauricio's uh, research uh, and help, help make differential intervention plans or treatment plans uh, for a child with concussive disorder. So there are two content scales that are very important in the BASC-3 that are pretty easy to overlook. A very powerful autism scale. Please look at the validity um, evidence on that and see if you agree, but that's our interpretation. And a very powerful executive functioning scale. Um, and again, please look at the validity evidence uh, on that and make your own independent decision. Um, but these two scales, quite frankly, turned out better than we could have ever imagined as we were designing the BASC-3. Uh, next slide, please. Self-reported personality. Um, for those of you who have um, used these scales previously, you're aware of the clinical and adaptive scales. Next slide, please. Uh, it um, covers a lot of ground, as you can see, for the self-report uh, and the content scales. Uh, you see four of them uh, at the bottom there and a functional impairment index at the child and adolescent level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to skip through this one as well, since you're probably familiar with this. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Oop, one more, please. <laughs> it's very comprehensive. Okay, content scales. Uh, so for the content scales, anger control, um, the item content, as you see, we tried to make uh, homogeneous in order to increase uh, reliability, um, both um, 
uh, internal reliability, internal consistency, reliability, and stability. Uh, ego strength, uh, like resilience, is a very important scale um, and says a lot about a, a child or adolescent or um, college age students' um, um, feelings about themselves. Uh, mania is a very important scale. That's another one, easy one to overlook uh, because it allows you to make a differential diagnosis between depression, ADHD, and juvenile, juvenile bipolar disease. Um, so uh, depression uh, used in, com in combination with mania, um, and they're both elevated, uh, might lead one to suspect, particularly in adolescents, uh, onset of juvenile bipolar disorder. So um, uh, this is a tough differential diagnosis to make, and that's why we include the mania, mania scale, so that you would have uh, dedicated measures, two of them, of the core symptoms of uh, bipolar disorder. Test anxiety, particularly important, what's important for all kids, but particularly for adolescents and young adults. Next um, slide, please. And uh, here's a description of the scales um, and the functional impairment index that appears here again. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, and um, kids uh, are more or less capable of telling us how they feel. It's one of the reasons why teachers teach um, about emotions in school. Uh, to help kids uh, recognize their emotions in order to um, better uh, regulate themselves. Next slide, please. SRP validity indexes are similar to the TRS and PRS with the exception of the lie index in particular, which is a fake good scale, which is really helpful for the SRP. So you have a fake bad index and basically a fake good index a lie index where they're not being quite straight with you, so to speak, um, in reporting their problems. So used in combination, these are very helpful. Again, one validity index that's in the elevated or extremely elevated range um, is helpful, but it, it's more disconcerting if you have two or more validity indexes that are problematic. That's when I really start to think about the validity problems. Uh, next slide, please. Very good. Uh, now I have the pleasure of transitioning the presentation. Again, um, there's much content in this system of measures. So please, uh, please do um, spend some time with the manual um, so that you can um, develop a deeper understanding of the scales. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, I have the pleasure of passing this uh, next part of the presentation off to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and uh, we'll welcome everybody. We'll, we certainly appreciate you being willing to spend some time with us today. I know that this is a very busy time of year, particularly for school psychologists. Um, last year, we uh, uh, released uh, for reporting uh, via the computer system, the computerized scoring systems, a new set of content scales, and these are true content scales. They are expert derived, devoted to matching the item content at the scale level to qualification for emotional disturbance under the IDEA, the definition of emotional disturbance. Uh, and those have become uh, very popular. Uh, folks, uh, particularly working in the schools, have given us a lot of very positive feedback about these scales. And there is a lengthier webinar just on these scales that you can access on the Pearson website. But we wanted to include some information about them today because they are content scales. So if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, these um, provide a prima facie match to the five qualifying criteria of the federal IDEA definition uh, of emotional disturbance. And when we say a prima facie match, uh, I wanna be clear about what that is. It matches it directly to the content of the federal definition. And as I'll say again today, 
uh, they do not tell you why a student behaves the way they behave, but it does match their behavior to the federal definition specifically in each of the qualifying areas for emotional disturbance. They also provide you with a social maladjustment indicator. The social maladjustment in indicator will review the derivation of momentarily. But remember that all of these scales are expert derived and are based upon a content matching of the BAS-3 clinical adaptive and content scales uh, to the federal criteria. We actually had information about doing this uh, in, uh, in a book that we wrote some years ago on clinical and research application for the BASC. And we had at that time consulted with a variety of experts uh, who had a wealth of experience in the schools in diagnosing ED under the IDEA criteria. And we formulated uh, uh, algorithms, if you will, back way back then for how to apply specifically the BASC scales and then the BAS 2 scales to the diagnosis of emotional disturbance in the schools. But because these um, essentially were buried in manuals, they didn't really surface very much and a, a number of people uh, really didn't attend to them. So we finally decided we would uh, step that up because they are so effective to the level of the actual content scales and put them into the computerized scoring report. And in doing that, we relied upon our earlier experts as well as going back through the revisions that had been done to BASC since that time and looking at the expert content matches based on current data and how well these scales fit the federal definition. So each of these scales, the EDQS, the Emotional Disturbance Qualification Scales, is a rescaled composite score of other BAS-3 scales. And we do provide separate gender and combined gender norms for the EDQS. We do not provide clinical norms for those, for what I hope are obvious reasons to you. Uh, the clinical norms will wipe out basically the differentiation ability uh, between normal and non-normal and give you a comparison of kids to other kids with a clinical diagnosis. So clinical norms are very useful in the context of triage and in differential diagnosis of DSM disorders when you have uh, an individual who has uh, particularly what we refer to as a floating profile, a student who has a lot of elevations on a lot of clinical scales. But for differentiating uh, normal from emotionally disturbed, clinical norms are not appropriate. So we have separate gender and combined gender norms. As you know, Randy and I have always recommended beginning with the original BASC and its development, going back to 1987, the use of combined gender norms as being the most accurate for specific diagnostic applications for all students. And that's also true of the EDQS. We give you the separate gender norms uh, for those of you who may disagree with us and also for follow-up if you want to ask the question of how this student compares to other students of the same gender, we can answer that question. But in general, for specific diagnostic and classification applications, combined gender norms are the appropriate norms for all students and are the most accurate. Next. The uh, composites for this, the, educated, the emotional determinant qualification scales match up to each of these IDEIA criteria. So 
the federal definition really hasn't changed uh, in any meaningful way since the original uh, Education for All Handicapped Children Act uh, that was passed in the 1970s. So they have been consistent. Uh, in many ways, it is um, ambiguous to some extent and includes exclusionary criteria as well. And the feds have not given us specific guidance on how to implement this. But we have matched these scales up to the specific areas uh, that are noted in the federal definition. So uh, we've numbered these for you because they correspond to uh, the sequence of definitional criteria in the IDEI regulations. Next. Here, we illustrate for you uh, the scale composition by form. So for example, uh, for the first area of qualification for emotional disturbance in IDEIA, you see if you look on the left-hand side of this, the forms uh, that uh, are applied and the scales that are applied. So for example, for the first criteria, we combine the aggression scale, conduct problems, withdrawal and developmental social disorders, all as they appear. And then we take two um, positive scales and reverse score those, the leadership scale and the social skills scale. And the content of all of those scales matches up really well to the first criteria for ED listed in the federal definition. And then you can scale down and see for the SRP child and the SRP adolescent, which scales are included. We did not go to the individual item level with this as we did the probability indexes. We went with scales. And so the EDQS uh, are a rescaling of a composite score. So we sum the T scores for each of the scales listed in each of these boxes, according to which of the ED criteria we're looking at and which form you're looking at, we sum the T scores of these and then rescale that to a new T score. And that's why you will note that sometimes it's possible that a child will not have a T score, say above. 60 or 65 on any of those scales, but they could well have an EDQS score that is 70 or higher. And that happens uh, just like it happens with IQ measures. For example, you might see that a child has a verbal and a nonverbal IQ that are both 80, yet their full scale IQ will be in the 70s. And the reason is the same. And that is that it is less likely for a student to trend in the same direction on a large number of scores that go into making up a composite score. So when you look at the overall behavior of the child on that specific construct, their level of behavioral problems and the degree of their emotional disturbance is easily pushed out in the distribution compared to other children if they have a larger number of problems across scales as opposed to a highly specific problem within a single scale area. But as you can see, some of the criteria of the federal definition are much more narrow than others. Uh, so you will see as you look across this that for the more narrow definitions given by the feds, you have a smaller number of past three scales. So these again were built to match the content. And it was done by expert analysis, which is the way we build content scales, very differently from the empirical building of the clinical and adaptive scales and the actuarial probability indexes. All of those were built with very rigid um, 
empirical modeling. These are built with expert content modeling. Next. The social maladjustment indicator is only offered for the teacher rating and parent ratings. And it doesn't mean that a child is or isn't uh, socially maladjusted, but it highlights cases that warrant further investigation by the clinician. The issue of social maladjustment is controversial and is absolutely vague and ambiguous in the federal legislation. It has not ever been operationally defined uh, by the feds in their rules and regulations. Consequently, its interpretation and use varies widely throughout the field. Some states and local districts will use DSM diagnoses such as conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder to uh, indicate exclusively the presence of social maladjustment. Some states and local districts do not do that. And so we see quite a bit of variance, not only in how social maladjustment is defined, but how it's applied. We encounter school districts, uh, for example, who will determine that, well, if a child has a conduct disorder or has ODD, they can't be emotionally disturbed. Well, that would be in contraindication to the actual federal regulations, but the feds have not given us a clear operational definition of social maladjustment. So how do we use and interpret social maladjustment and its definition remain controversial in the absence of clear guidance from the feds? The BAS-3 EDQS or, uh, uh, indicators are not intended to supersede local policies, but rather to provide aggregated normative data based on a prima facie match to the federal definition of ED. So the social maladjustment is, indicator is offered as a suggestion to you that further assessment procedures may be warranted depending on the guidelines that have been set forth by your state and your local jurisdiction. But regardless, it is important to note that many students who are socially maladjusted are also emotionally disturbed. And being socially maladjusted does not rule out emotional disturbance. The comorbidity rate between social maladjustment and certain forms of emotional disturbance is in fact quite high. And conduct disorder and ODD are good examples of that, where they overlap, um, uh, particularly in young boys, with diagnoses of depression and anxiety. So we see that these are not clear-cut, clean distinctions. The EDQS social maladjustment algorithm, you should know, emphasizes the detection of social maladjustment in the absence of other prima facie indications of emotional disturbance. And it will be unusual for an examinee with the BASC EDQS and the SM to give positive results on both, but it will happen. There are instances where both will occur, but it will be less common than an elevation on one or the other. Next. This is how the uh, algorithm was derived for the social maladjustment profile on the PRS and TRS. And to the extent that you disagree with this, don't use it. Uh, this, again, is based on an expert content analysis in the absence of clear guidance for an operational definition from the feds. So in the absence of an operational definition in the regulations, we're all left to our own devices to decide 
what is and what isn't social maladjustment. So the uh, experts that we have consulted and Randy and I's own expertise in doing this and having done it now longer than we want to admit, uh, basically Randy and I have been doing this since uh, uh, the mid to late 1970s. Uh, this is the algorithm that we settle on. So when we see aggression, hyperactivity, and content and conduct problems with T's all above 60, concurrent with low anxiety and low, and low depression, that is below 60, and an adaptive composite, that's below 45, then we designate that as an indicator of possible social maladjustment. But you need to take if you're going to make that determination, and I use the word need carefully. Um, uh, I, I really don't like to tell people what I think they need to do. But in this instance, it really is need to conduct a careful and detailed history along with a careful and detailed clinical interview and to consider the behavior in the context of the child's overall life. That's what's necessary to ultimately make the decision. Because as the clinician, you make the decision. I've said it many times and I'll continue to say it. Tests don't diagnose, clinicians do. And you are all well-trained, experienced clinicians. So, uh, we provide you guidance, we provide you empirical data, uh, all of which is there to assist you in your diagnostic decision making. If you've given the SRP and it's an adolescent case, we also think you should consider the scores on sensation seeking in determining social maladjustment because it will most often be elevated uh, on the SRPA with folks who do have SN. Next. So always remember that the presence of social maladjustment does not grant any form of immunity from emotional disturbance as defined in IDEIA. Yes, you can have SM and ED. You can have a substance abuse uh, diagnosis and ED. And that comment is there because I have personally encountered school districts around the country who in dealing with adolescents have decided arbitrarily that if an adolescent has a substance abuse problem or a substance abuse diagnosis, they classify them as socially maladjusted only and refuse to serve them as ED and special ed. Well, one of the things that you know uh, as an astute clinician is that one of the reasons adolescents initiate and continue substance abuse is to self-medicate because they have emotional and behavioral problems. Emotional and behavioral problems that they don't understand, but they recognize and they self-medicate. So just remember, you can have most any diagnosis and be emotionally disturbed. There are no known immunizing disorders. Um, uh, you know, you can be a depressed schizophrenic. Uh, so there's nothing that grants you immunity from any other disorder by having it. Next. The BAS-3 EDQS are only available by computer scoring. There is no hand scoring option available. And by the way, I would remind you, if you're hand scoring BAS-3, uh, you, you should probably investigate uh, medication for that um, because you're engaging in self-torture. Uh, the computer scoring options are so fast and so inexpensive. Uh, I think uh, now the uh, unlimited uh, computer scoring subscription that includes all of the interventions uh, materials and pulls the best interventions into the actual computerized report is only $65 a year. And one of the key words there is unlimited. 
uh, use. Uh, so think about what your time is worth. Uh, by the time you hand score two of these, uh, your salary time is probably paid for more than uh, a year of unlimited computerized scoring. Uh, so uh, this is available on all the computer scoring options and there's no added cost for including uh, the EDQS. It's automatically included with the other content scales unless you deselect it in the Q Global Report menu options. So keep in mind that if there are things in the computer scoring report that you don't like or you don't want or you don't want other people to see because you don't agree with, uh, with them being included or don't think they're reliable or valid or relevant to your practice, you can deselect those in the menu option. And the EDQS uh, are uh, a set of scales that you can deselect if you don't want to use them. Next. So we do need to differentiate between the emotional and behavioral disorder index, the EBD index, and the EDQS. Now, as Dr. Kenthouse mentioned, these were created using radically different methods. So they are complementary, and they give you quite different types of information. And because of their different derivations, they will not always agree, although they'll agree more often than not. The EBD index is a probability index. It's actuarially derived with no regard for the item content. So it was based on going to the item level statistics and looking at the ability of every item in the BAS to differentiate purely statistically. Students who were in a special education program with a pre-existing classification of ED from students in the normal non-referred population. So the EBD index reflects how closely the BAS scores match those of students who were identified and placed in an ED program. So that sample uh, that was used to derive this represents students who were actually classified and placed in special education programs. Now, that is useful but in some ways it's problematic because Randy and I perceive, and I think there's good data to back this up, a national referral bias that favors teacher referrals of students who tend to be aggressive and display more externalizing problems. So the EBD index then correlates more highly with externalizing disorders and is less sensitive to students with internalizing disorders. Simply because in the school, students with internalizing disorders are more likely to be missed when it comes to an ED referral. In sharp contrast, the five composites of the EDQS are solely content-derived scales based on expert opinion and consensus to match the content of the BAS three scales to the federal definitions. So they will pick up on the types of symptoms that are less sensitive to teacher referral. So these two sets of scales give you very different types of information and information that is complementary and additive to one another. So don't be concerned if in 100% of your cases, they don't match up. Uh, it has to do with how they were derived and the type of information that they're giving you. Next. So here's an example of the table that you will get with this in the computer score report. This is an example from a TRS child version uh, for an eight-year-old. And so when you see that table in the report, uh, it will give you the raw score, the T-score according to each of the five areas, uh, the percentile rank, the conference interval, 
and the clinical indication, whether it's uh, in the clinically significant range, the at-risk range, or the acceptable range. And you can see that this particular child showed high levels of scores of clinical significance in multiple areas. Uh, and uh, it just so happens that using, uh, using Zoom, I can't see the bottom line uh, on my screen. Uh, the way this is set up. So uh, uh, I can't see the SM indicator there. So um, when you see uh, these scales presented this way, we do give you some follow-up narrative interpretation as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the narrative is brief and to the point and simply indicates whether or not uh, these scores fall in a clinically significant or other range and will specify the range, give you the percentile rank, and indicate, uh, for example, in this case, the teacher reports that John has significant dif difficulty establishing and or maintaining relationships with others compared to same age peers. So, uh, these are very straightforward, very simple interpretations that can be used and you are free with the BASC uh, computerized reports uh, to copy and paste uh, into your reports. We encourage you then to edit uh, those narratives to fit your case specifically, uh, but we do give you permission uh, to uh, copy and paste into your reports, our tables, the narrative, but again, please go in and adjust them so that they fit your case more specifically. So again, you'll see that these are very straightforward uh, in terms of interpretation. And in this particular case, even I couldn't see it on the other slide, uh, apparently the social maladjustment indicator was present. Uh, the teacher's responses suggest that John exhibits behaviors that are inconsistent with societal norms much more than same age peers. That social maladjustment may be present. And then we note that there needs to be a follow-up assessment or intervention based upon uh, the laws and regulations in the appropriate jurisdiction. So again, emphasizing the need for a detailed history and a detailed comprehensive clinical interview. Thanks. Uh, here's another example just to show you uh, uh, what the SRP looks like uh, with these scales. Once again, it's formatted the same way. All of these are very similar as they'll be presented to you. So you can see the context of their presentation and understand it better across the different BASC forms. So once again, we have a particular child here, an adolescent, who is reporting a great deal of consistency with the federal definition of emotional disturbance. Next. We have the next slide, please. So we need to be careful in using this. These are new combinations of scales grouped to align with the constructs of emotional disturbance as represented in the federal definition. These serve as the minimum criteria that are used to determine eligibility for special education as ED under the federal rules. So we believe these are useful when conducting comprehensive psychoeducational evaluations for special education e eligibility but don't forget that they are expert scales designed to match the criteria in the federal definition and the federal rules. But as I said earlier, remember, they do not answer the question of why students behave as they do. And the why question can be critical to getting the classification and diagnosis right. Some students, who meet the criteria for ED based on behavior may be better categorized under a different disability when the behaviors are better accounted for by the other disability. 
some good examples of this uh, for, uh, for our purposes are uh, students who have ADHD or ASD. So as you know, nearly all students with ADHD will have inappropriate behavior under normal circumstances. Sometimes this will be caused by an emotional disturbance. And it may be useful to qualify them as other health impaired and as emotionally disturbed. But in many cases, this inappropriate behavior under normal circumstances may be better accounted for by the presence of their ADHD. The way to determine that is by the history, by the clinical interview, and by the context of the behaviors and where they occur and looking at the context of the behavior in the child's overall life space. Examinees on the autism spectrum will almost always be unable to build and maintain appropriate relationships with peers and teachers. So again, when seeking the most appropriate school placement for a student with ASD whose ED indicators are elevated, it's important to discern whether the qualifying behaviors are in addition to ASD or caused directly by the ASD. And to reiterate, uh, and I, I can never say this often enough, I, I don't think, this determination is best accomplished then via detailed history and clinical interview in the context of a comprehensive evaluation. That's how we discover why kids behave the way they behave. As another example, we know that students with intellectual disability have a higher prevalence, prevalence rate of mental health disorders than those with normal intellectual development. Some students may exhibit immature behaviors consistent with their developmental level, and that may give the appearance of ED, however. So again, examiners should investigate the source of the ED symptoms because they may be an indication of comorbid ED or they may be better accounted for by the student's diagnosis of intellectual disability and the behaviors may simply be immature for chronological age but consistent with their overall developmental level. So I realize you're being tasked with something that you may see as being very difficult and in some ways subjective. But that is the state of the federal definition and the guidance from the feds. They task us as clinicians with making these important distinctions. And these are distinctions that are commonly asked of clinicians in the field and is consistent with many of the things, for example, that clinicians are instructed to do in the context of DSM diagnosis. So it's nothing new, and it's not specific to the federal regs in the schools for ED. We see that we are asked as clinicians to make these judgments and distinctions across many different contexts, and it's part and parcel of what we do. And again, the answer is to do comprehensive evaluations. So we think you've given, we've given you better empirical guidance than you've had before with this, but that empirical guidance should not supersede your clinical judgment based upon a comprehensive evaluation that also includes a detailed history and a detailed clinical exam. Next. There is a guide available to you if you are a BASC-3 user. Uh, it's available to you for free. And it's a supplemental information guide devoted to the EDQS. Uh, it's on the Pearson website. It's only six pages long. But please read it uh, before using these scales to make any decisions about students. So if you go to the resource library in QGlobal, You'll be able to pull that up, um, read it, uh, 
and I think you'll understand it very quickly. It's very straightforward. We've covered the information that's in it today, but it's always good to go back and read that. And I promise you it won't take you very long and it will give you a better perspective. Next. And remember that qualification means access to services, but differential diagnosis is crucial to treatment success. So even though the EDQS will tell you in part whether or not a child is eligible for services, it doesn't tell you the specific IEP goals that should be there. It doesn't tell you what approach to take. It doesn't tell you what interventions are required. That requires differential diagnosis. And the treatment of child and adolescent emotional behavioral disorders should never be one size fits all. The evidence-based literature argues strongly in favor of matching treatments to diagnoses and dimensions of behavior who are to be effective in treatment. For example, treating a child with a diagnosis of depression is very different than treating a child with a diagnosis of ODD, for example, or ADHD, or ASD, or an anxiety disorder or somatization disorder. So the treatments that are effective are different based on the underlying disorders. And students with emotional and behavioral disorders in the schools deserve treatment, not just management. And a declaration of eligibility, such as ED, is insufficient to guide specific treatment. The content scales and the actuarial scales are often useful in differential diagnosis. The EDQS are targeted at qualification for services, that is eligibility to be served as ED. But the content scales and the actuarial indexes are particularly useful in differential diagnosis since they help us conceptualize as well as quantify our approach for each individual student. Next. Remember, one size fits all does not work. We don't want to be McDonald's. Next. We have to match the treatment to the diagnosis. Once we know the underlying problem, we can be much more effective in providing a treatment plan or intervention that will work. Next. The BAS-3 model provides the guidance and the BAS-3 materials to wherewithal to make accurate differential diagnosis of EBDs. We give you materials to help you with the history and context, that is the structured developmental history, to evaluate current behavior in multiple settings, both at home and with different teachers in different settings in the schools. Then we provide you with an SRP, the self-report to look at the child's own feelings and perceptions. So we're gathering data using multiple methods. We have the student observation system, a time sampling method you can take into the classroom and observe children very efficaciously. And we link all of this to evidence-based interventions as well as progress monitoring forms that allow you to quantitatively assess change over time. Next. And remember, don't interpret test data blindly. You might interpret uh, this Rorschach response very differently knowing that it came from a flying insect. Next. Well, bugs and Rorschachs just go well together. Sorry about that, but uh, next. Remember that history and context are crucial. And it's uh, kind of one of my soapbox issues that I really emphasize in all of my talks. A careful history is the most powerful weapon in the arsenal of every clinician. So keep that in mind. Next. Context of a child's life is always important. Uh, you may think that that looks like dinner. I promise you to a chicken, that's a horror movie. So if you don't understand the context of a student's life, 
I propose that you will frequently misinterpret test data. Understand the context of a child's life. Know who you are evaluating. Symptoms do not mean the same thing for everyone. Do not diagnose raccoons with insomnia because they stay up all night. Next. Just as a quick example, if you were to look at all of these symptoms and find these and validate the presence of these symptoms in the same in, in, in an individual, all of these symptoms, what would your diagnosis be? Well, these symptoms have complete overlap with three disorders. Next. How would you differentiate? You differentiate these disorders with these common overlapping symptoms by virtue of their histories and clinical presentation. These disorders, while they have very, very high percentages of symptom overlap, have very different histories. Next. So I wanted us to have a little bit of time here at the end for some question and answer for you. We have some bonus slides that are gonna to come to you in the handout, which you will get in a few days. Uh, and it will speak to the student observation system that I mentioned, and also to the Flex Monitor, which allows you to develop personalized, quantitative empirical monitoring for behavioral change. So those are bonuses. There are other uh, webinars you can find for free uh, on the Pearson website about those specifically. But for now, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, I'm not sure uh, who was uh, uh, monitoring the questions for us, but uh, let's go back to the organizers and see if there are some frequent questions that have been asked that Randy or I can address for you before we have to end. Chris, do you have any questions that have come in recently that we can ask and answer during the rest of the session? Sorry, I was having trouble unmute, um, unmuting. Um, let me see some of the ones that we have here. I see one about um, a question about, do you think the EDQS skills are valuable to those of us who are outside the US and not impacted by IDEA? Well, um, it, it really depends on the setting that you're in. It, I think, gives you a good indication that certainly those individuals are experiencing significant uh, uh, distress and behaviors that would cause disruption in a variety of environments. That to me would indicate um, a need for intervention. So I think they are useful in that regard. They are not going to provide you with the differential diagnosis to know um, specifically what intervention, but I think they will tell you that this is a person uh, with whom we need to engage and provide some interventions as we move on to more detailed differential diagnosis. Great, thank you. I see another one about um... Any thoughts on using combined gender norms with individuals who identify as transgender or non-binary gender? What limitations should we be aware of in using the BAS-3 with that population? The, um, the individuals who are transgender, non-binary, LGBTQ populations are all included in the BAS-3 standardization sample. None of those were exclusionary criteria uh, for individuals coming into that sample. And in fact, um, the combined gender norms are by far uh, the best norms to use with that population. Uh, I have seen people 
uh, argue that, well, you know, nothing out there is normed on folks who are transgender or non-binary, so we don't have anything we can use with them. Well, in fact, if you had norms for non-binary, transgender, other LGBTQ populations, and you use those norms, those norms would discriminate against serving those kids. And that's counterintuitive in a lot of ways, but it's absolutely true. For example, we do know that the children and adolescents who are transgender and non-binary have higher stress levels at school. They have higher anxiety levels. And if we were to normalize those by using norms based on transgender populations, for example, it would tell us that, well, yeah, that they have anxiety, but it's not significantly different from other students with, uh, with trans, who are transgender. Well, then we would tend not to want to serve them. But in fact, their anxiety and the stress that they feel is just as debilitating and just as real to them as it is for non-transgender, non-binary, uh, non non non-binary students and so uh, we want to serve them they have just as much of a right to treatment to alleviate that stress that anxiety the depression they may be experiencing as do other students and the proper way to detect that is to use combined gender norms great thank you how do you recommend explaining atypicality to parents? Randy, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> That's a great question because uh, the, the uh, reason the question is asked is because the atypicality scale tends to be elevated for a variety of populations. Most of the time it's secondary, sometimes it's primary, but you should first know that the atypicality scale is um, a psychoticism scale. That was the original design. And we, like I said earlier, we didn't wanna call the psychoticism scale a psychoticism scale uh, because it just uh, sends off too many alarms in the, in the um, minds of teachers and parents and psychologists and counselors alike. So um, because we know that a high atypicality score or a high psychoticism score could be due to alternative causes other than childhood schizophrenia, for example. Mm -hmm. So, so the, uh, remember first, the atypicality score is a well-disguised psychoticism score. The good news about childhood psychosis, like childhood schizophrenia, is that it's extremely rare. So this scale is most likely to be ele elevated for a child with uh, childhood schizophrenia or adolescent schizophrenia, for example. Um, if you're um, assessing a population such as a hospitalized population or an inpatient psychiatric unit in a hospital setting, for example, where there's a higher prevalency rate of childhood schizophrenia. In other settings, such as routine and assessment, uh, assessments in school for dyslexia, written expression disorder, um, ADHD, for example, in those sorts of assessment circumstances, childhood schizophrenia diagnoses are very rare and atypicality scores that are elevated that can be attributed to childhood schizophrenia are very rare. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but we're talking about probabilities here. So in the, in sort of the typical school referral setting, the typical uh, private practice referral setting, a high atypicality score is going to be better explained as unusual behavior associated with a child who has uh, a diagnosable condition. So for example, uh, you'll sometimes see cases, actually you'll often see cases where there are elevated externalizing composite scores on the BAST TRS or PRS, uh, elevated um, hyperactivity, attention problems, aggression problem scores, and 
the atypicality score is elevated as well. In that case, uh, I would explain to parents, you see this um, scale called atypicality. It's another indication of, of the severity of the, the child's problems associated with their attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So it's a reflection of the ADHD and the severity of the ADHD. Another possible scenario that's not unusual is assessment for the presence or reevaluation of children or youth with intellectual disabilities. And for them, uh, you will typically see uh, lower adaptive skill scores, a high atypicality score, and a high withdrawal score. In those circumstances where there is um, uh, significantly below average cognitive development or intelligence, the atypicality score, I would explain to that parent or teacher, is a reflection of the unusualness of their behavior and the severity of their problems associated with an intellectual disability. So, um, so there, essentially there are three interpretations of atypicality. I'm sorry, two interpretations of atypicality. One is that it's a secondary indicator of another uh, psychiatric condition or developmental disorder like autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disabil disability. The second interpretation, and this is the more important one, is that it's a primary indicator of childhood psychosis, um, and the typical diagnosis for that is going to be childhood or adolescent schizophrenia, and that is going to be extremely rare. So just like in medicine, um, you're trained to uh, make the most high prevalent diagnosis first uh, because you're more likely to be correct, same in psychology. So with the atypicality score, your most frequent interpretation is that it's a reflection of another condition. And that's simply what I would tell parents and I would go no further. And it's only in those rare circumstances where you have compelling evidence of a psychotic break or uh, psychotic symptomatology that you would interpret it as a psychosis scale. I still wouldn't use the term psychosis with parents. I would just say that this atypicality score um, is a reflection of the uh, diagnosis you receive from the psychiatrist that your child um, unfortunately is suffering from early onset uh, schizophrenia. I hope that helps. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Campos and Dr. Reynolds for being here today and sharing all this information. We've had additional questions come in um, and unfortunately we're out of time, but thank you everyone for joining us today um, for sharing this information, for asking good questions. And um, just as a follow-up, there are additional uh, webinars that were recorded and can be found on the Pearson website on the BASC page um, that go into more detail on the EDQS and on the Flex Monitor, because we've seen quite a few uh, questions come in for both of those. So be sure to check those out. Um, and thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all.